Now, breaking a habit is difficult, but don't worry, lads, because Fume may just have the answer for us. Because not everything in a habit is bad, so instead of making drastic, uncomfortable changes, why not just remove the bad from the habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavoured air device that takes the bad from the habit. Instead of vapour, it uses flavoured air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavours. Like I just told you, well, you're not listening. That's because of the bad habits you're on. Sharpen up. That's all I'm saying. Use Fume. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting. This actually gives you a lot to do with your fingers and it's helpful for like de-stressing, anxiety and just keeping your hands busy and avoiding breaking the habit. Now the flavours are fantastic, they come with lots of different options so there'll be something for everyone. My favourite lately has been the orange vanilla flavour. You literally just pop the cartridge in your fume and away you go. Fume sent me the journey pack which is the ideal option to break your habit. And if you want to get that, all you've got to do is go to tryfume.com that's t-o-y-f-u-m.com slash true and use my code true and that'll get you 10 percent off at checkout which will make starting the good habit that little bit easier so good luck to all of you lot who want to make that positive change in your life and try fume and thanks to them for 10 percent off when you use my code true Right, welcome back to the True Geordie podcast. Today's guest is the seven time Mr. Olympia, Phil Heath. Thanks for coming, mate. No, thanks for having me. This set is freaking beautiful. This is outstanding. Thank you very much, mate. And it means your, a lot. And your wall of greatness. Yeah, you're going to be on there next. Hopefully, I get some signed off here. Before oh, yeah, you go. I got I to gotta send you something special after seeing really? all this. Oh, I got to figure something out for you. Cool, man. Yeah. Cause I'm a competitive dude. So I'm looking at, <laughs> yeah, he's got all these weight belts and, you know, yeah. these championship belts and the gloves. I'm like, yeah. mm, what can I, maybe a dumbbell or something. I don't know. Yeah, you belong on there, man. <laughs> I, I watched your career. I literally, well, my dad was an amateur bodybuilder. Ah. Uh, so he, I grew up being told about Haney and, and, and Dorian Yates, yeah. and, uh, obviously Arnold. Um, so then when I found bodybuilding, I was like, okay, let me learn from these guys. I was watching you, uh, Jay, mm -hmm. Kai, and that, to me was the last great era of bodybuilding mm -hmm. like it's just not quite the same anymore and i actually think you weren't appreciated man mm. you know like and, and even by me because i remember like watching you being like this guy's unstoppable <laughs> like and you're like fuck this guy. <laughs> no <laughs> not quite as bad no but i mean like, but it was yeah. like I, I like kai and i felt like oh, the poor little underdog when's he gonna get one and yeah and it was a hell of a storyline mm -hmm. and it was a bit like we right like there yeah. was a storyline yes and it made me care mm -hmm. and now i don't care as much because the you were like the triple h you know we needed that guy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. without you i and I realize, like, it's just not the same, man. Yeah. You think you've you've heard that a bit? And I've heard that quite a bit now because it's been going on four years of mm. me not competing. And, yeah, it, it does feel different, you know, going to expos and then having fans come up and say, you know, I didn't really like you, <laughs> but I respect the hell out of what you created. And then also, you know, you and Kai, man, it just, like you said, we made people care. And it was because we cared. We cared so much about being number one that we did we didn't like each other. Mm. Why would you like someone that's like nipping at your heels? And why would he like me for being the guy that's in his way mm -hmm. of achieving what he always dreamed about? What he sacrificed everything for? I mean, we all know his story. You know, being an orphan in Brooklyn and mm -hmm. going through all these trials and tribulations, and then you have this guy that comes out of nowhere the from gift. A, from a basketball background of crying out loud and yeah. just phew, and then. You know, but I will say, Kai and I had, um, you know, some early battles that people may not remember. He beat me at the Arnold Classic in 2010 because mm. he had won the previous year in 2009 and looked phenomenal. And I didn't compete at that particular show. So in um, 2009, uh, he won the Arnold. I got sick at that year's Olympia. So he placed one slot ahead of me that year. And then that following year, I did the Ar we both did the Arnold Classic. And then he repeated as champion. And I was not happy with that because, you know, he, I wanted that Arnold Classic. And I made sure after that show, I said, look, I was up by three points after prejudging and I lost by seven at night. I was like, I've never understood, like, how could I lose this type of event? That's really confusing to me how that, how it changes. Yeah, so much. like I just didn't understand. And. You know, instead of like bitching and moaning and going up to a judge and saying, what could I do? I was like, 
Well, I know what I need to do. And that's just become so great that he'll never stand a chance. And, you know, it was very difficult holding him off, but I enjoyed every minute of it, every rep of it. And, um, you know, standing in his way was something that, you know, I take great pride with because I know his body of work. I know how hard he trains. Mm -hmm. I know how hard this guy didn't cheat on a diet. We all watched his, you know, story. I watched it. So to, to know that we both cared so much made the audience care. I mean, there would be the team Kai team Phil at the Olympia. And there's been some like almost scraps <laughs> I know, like right? at the expo. <laughs> I've heard some stories, man. So it's, but yeah, today's, it's just different, man, is I think we're going through this uh, transition where because of maybe some other divisions, yeah. um, some of the fans in open are like, oh, well, we like these categories. And then the open class guys are kind of just lacking maybe that fire. And I don't know if it's because of social media. I don't know how you feel about that. Like social media may be making it more just like, oh, let's be all be friends and let's just work the algorithm and make some money, <laughs> you know? Like, I feel like the standard setter isn't there. That's mm -hmm. the problem is we always had a passing of the torch mm -hmm. from, uh, I think it was Haney to Yates to Yates, to, you know, uh, Ronnie, Ronnie to Jay, Jay to you. Yeah. And, it, and when, when, when that torch was passed, we were like, that's the guy. Yeah. And the standard was set and the, and the level of competition because you had a competitiveness in you, mm -hmm. for example, to not let that standard slip. Yep. It felt like you were uncatchable, which made everyone go, oh, well, I have to come in unbelievable then. Right. Whereas because there, this, because champions change every year now, because there isn't someone who really holds the bodybuilding stand to such a level, what are we searching for? What are we chasing here? Yeah. It's, it's, quite disappointing mm. in that aspect but i think uh, life is like a circle when we look at arnold's career when he had retired the first time how many champions were there in between you know there's yeah. a few and then he came back and won again in 80 um i think we're kind of going through that right now that i want to ask a question because i don't know if it's just the way it feels mm -hmm. but it feels like for decades mm -hmm. yes Bodybuilding, yeah, there was, you know, there was steroids and all of this, right? And then, yep. but, but the point was, is the work, yeah. the dedication mm -hmm. was first and foremost. Correct. And it feels like a lot of people are a bit lazier, a bit more like, I don't think that they understand that. No. I, I feel like they're just leaning on the drugs or whatever. It's hard for me to even admit this for a lot of the guys because I don't want them to take this the wrong way, but I believe you're pretty spot on with this. Mm. Um, we don't see it in the eyes. We don't see it in their soul. Mm -hmm. You know, people can sing, but when someone sang that song, yeah. you know, when that's, when someone is, you know, I believe just because of YouTube, because of social media, like we're saying things just to get a click. It's tough, man. I, I, I always pose this challenge to people. Would you be as intense if no cameras were on? If someone just happened to see you training, with there not being a camera in sight for six months, would you still have that desire? Like the shadow of Dorian Yates attitude. I, no one, no one got no, to see him right. until he kept that one, that one said. Didn't care. Now and, social media. And I get it. There's that, there's that part, mm. which I did exhibit as well because I was still in that social media. You know, I was at the beginning, right? But I was willing to do that work up until 2020 with no cameras in it, mm -hmm. just me and the, the, the weights and even my wife being there at mm -hmm. the same time, we weren't in there filming all night. And yeah, maybe that came at a detriment to say, yeah, you know, that would have been great content during the prime years of your career. I still have the pictures. I still have some videos that I haven't released, but I have the titles to prove that I did the work. And I, I do believe that, yes, you're trying to build the following. The sponsors, as well like they only pay attention to the numbers not the titles anymore mm. and i think that's what changed it so i can't blame a competitive bodybuilder see they're they're at a crossroad where am i an influencer or a competitive bodybuilder and they have a, a difficult time like it I, feels like the sport is the sporting yeah. element is decreasing because and the that. show off and the yeah. social media is increasing right because i could tell you right now if, if someone came to me and said phil like i really believe i can be mr olympia i'd say okay film as much content as you want for one entire month and then come see me because for the next three months it's going to be hell but i could promise you that you're going to be way better than what you were 
Yeah. I could promise you. I don't think people realize the standard. Like, I mean, I went to train with Dorian in 2012. Oh, yeah. And it was it was this idea I had, like, I just want to find out what it's like, right? And I thought I was training hard. Right? <laughs> and and, you and I was like one of the toughest trainers in my gym. Yeah. So I go in there and I'm like, right, let's see what, it, and I went back workout, Dorian, right? So Dorian. You started off with back <laughs> Yeah, in, in, you know, in the dungeon. In the right? dungeon. So I'm like, I'm really, really wet behind the ears, clearly, because. The first, the first machine was over, and I was like, "Holy shit! Yeah, I am fucked. Yeah, you're I got wrecked. nothing left yet, right?" And that was when, like, and Dory's like, "Now the real work begins, boy." Yeah, and I was like, "Oh shit!" So I go back to my gym, and I'm like, "We're not even training hard, mate. We don't even know what hard training is. Correct. We are so delusional, mm-hmm. and what, and that's what I don't think anyone." who until they get in the in a in a in a session with someone like yourself mm-hmm. has any comprehension of, and that's why. You're a fucking demon, mate. I know that. Yeah. But other people don't understand. They say the muscles, the cartoonish, like muscular. Right. They don't understand the work that goes into it. And do you know what? I watched your documentary last night mm. and it was so great. Right. Thank you. And Thank I, you. I say that as just a fan of documentaries anyway, not even the bodybuilding thing. I think everyone can enjoy this. Mm-hmm. But why it was great for me was you were unstoppable in my eyes. You weren't mm-hmm. even, you didn't really have much of a human feel to you in terms of vulnerability. Right. But to then go back and go, oh shit, he was really going through a lot the whole yeah. time. Yeah. And he was just so fucking strong yes. that he could overcome that and then outwardly project, I'm indestructible because you're not showing any weakness to everyone in the competition, right. but you're holding it in. And now we got to see that. And I really appreciated you showing that. No, I'm so glad that you watched it. And mm. thank you for all those kind words. I mean, and you're absolutely right. You're so spot on with this. I mean, everybody goes through pain. Everyone goes through it. But when you realize what your calling is, there's no, there's no time for it. Mm -hmm. There's no time for the, the woe me. And oh man, like I have a job to do. I have to suppress this for right now because I see what's going on. I have an opportunity to be the best in the world, if not the best ever. And it's going to require me to put some things to the side until I can deal with them. The problem is, is that they do end up growing. The demons. The demons, man. man. That's what I felt about you. It's like them demons were there from early. Yeah. And they kind of helped you. Yeah. But eventually they come back out. They come back out and uh, we see it in other athletes as well. I feel like I remember watching Mike Tyson talk about the demons and stuff and I'm sitting there. It's like, yep, I know what that means. Um, I'm just very glad that I was able to leverage it because I could hear those whispers from that damn freaking demon. Mm -hmm. Like you got to kill these mother, (laughs) you got to get them. And you're like, I just want to chill. I just want to hang out. I just want to know what it feels like to have a summer to myself, to hang out with my friends and family. I just want to know what it feels like to go to a birthday party, a kid's party with my friends, hold them up and play. I want to know what it feels like going on a summer vacation not worrying about, you know, the macros and did I train or not? And I just want to know what it feels like to be still and be able to cry about something that has been bothering me for years. And that was unavailable to me. And I made it such a big deal that I just held it inside and said, you know what, now's not the time. Because if you allow that out right now, you may downward spiral and not be able to pull yourself back up to do this job. So a lot of men out there, especially men, yourself included, we all go through these pain points mm. where life isn't fair when things happen and you suppress it. And then, you know, you have the blank stare. And then your wife is like, what's wrong, honey? And you're like, oh, nothing. Oh, nothing. When everything is wrong. Everything is, and you, is and, so true. And you don't know the words. You don't have the emotional intelligence yet to communicate these feelings properly. Mm-hmm. It comes out in rage normally. Fuck, yeah, yeah, I'm like, leave me alone. Or, ah, and I, you know, you, you, it becomes so overwhelming where you, all you see is red sometimes, all you see is darkness sometimes. And for me, it, you know, it took a long time, even most recent, to kind of get through it. And God bless my wife, man, because she could have easily left and just was like, you know what, like, figure your shit out. Maybe I'll be around, maybe I won't. But she was like, nope, you need to kill this ego. And I learned that I can't kill him. I don't need to kill this ego. I need to acknowledge him. Because you know what that ego did? 
It got me through those workouts. It got me through that pain. It got me through those moments where, you know, like when my dad died and I still had to train and, and get ready for the show. It, it still happened when his wife, my stepmom, she died a couple years later. And I have a brother that is high functioning autistic living in Seattle. Now I got to provide more money to make sure he's okay and all these other things. And then you have the internet beating your ass every day, but then you're so fixated on that that you can't acknowledge the fact that you have millions of people that love you and that you have one of the greatest physiques of all time. And then you have Sandow's in your house. You're not thinking of any of this. You're not appreciating any of this. And then finally realizing that through loss, holy crap, I have all this stuff to uncover. And that's what breaking Olympia really um, it, it, breaking Olympia gave me an opportunity to be the most vulnerable Phil Heath ever. And that's what you're going to see. And you saw that. And I just want to say, thanks, man. It, it's a, it's almost like, I feel like I'm going to have a lot of brotherhood. I'm creating a brotherhood. It feels like it. Cause everyone I've talked to, especially males, like mm -hmm. strong guys like yourself, yeah. we have all of these, first of all, we're highly intelligent. We go through life. We deal with the shit. We keep going, but then we wonder, are we by ourselves in this process? Mm -hmm. And it feels lonely as hell sometimes. And we have our moments, whether we want to cry about it, you know, by ourselves or just be angry. It's one or the other. It's an emotion. <laughs> oh, fuck. You know, it's an emotion, but I'm so thankful that this got picked up. Um, when I was, uh, introduced, um, to this idea by uh, Adam Scorgi and uh, Brett Harvey. I was blown away because it wasn't about, oh, how many ounces of protein and, you know, what's your cycle? What's this? What's that? It was like, no, this is like, who is Phil Heath? Like, who is he? And when they challenged me with that, I was like, you really want to know? And they're like, mm hmm. And we're going to pull it out of you. Mm -hmm. And then here I am digging a deep breath. And I'm like, okay. It's going to get ugly. They're like, that's fine. We can talk about it all. We can pull all your pictures out from childhood, this, that, and the other. So it was very therapeutic. And my intention along with theirs was just to show that through my body of work, through my story, it's kind of channeling that connectivity between me and other males that are going through the same thing. Winning the Mr. Olympia is not relatable. That's the vehicle for the story, but yeah. it's not, it's not it's the story. Not, yeah. yeah. Going through life is relatable. Exactly. <laughs> going through life. Yeah. And then saying... Yep. I still got to go to work. Mm -hmm. The trash man still has to go to work when something bad happens. You know, the CEO, there's like, I got all these employees and stuff and I still have to be strong in front of these people because I have a responsibility to take care of their families. They mm -hmm. think it's because of me. It's because I got 30 people that rely on me. They, they, if I screw up, they have no insurance. They have no 401k. They have no investments. They have no Christmas. They have nothing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just, it's just really cool that, um, this was made and it got picked up by Universal. I mean, to have a studio release, it was, you know, it was a dream come true. And of course, having Danny Garcia and freaking Dwayne The Rock Johnson a part of it. That was so cool. I mean, I can't even complain. There's nothing I can complain about, nah. like at all. <laughs> Honestly, like when I was watching it, I wrote something down about like, because everything you've said about how men will identify with this, I, I was literally looking at so many elements of my own life through you and going, there's a man here who doesn't really like himself, but on the other hand, has an ego and he doesn't want to be denied for what he can fucking achieve. Mm -hmm. So he's telling me, I don't really like myself, but I'll not let you fucking <laughs> stop me from getting what I want out of life. That's right. And I'm coming for it and I'm going to find a way to become great. And, mm -hmm. and, and one day I might learn to love myself mm -hmm. through that. Yeah. And the question I had at the end of it was, do you love yourself now though? Yes. Yeah. That's great. Finally. That is great, man. It was tough, dude. Mm -hmm. Very hard. And you know, it's something that, uh, just because you say, yes, I love myself. It's like, it's not over. Yeah. You have to repetitively say this. You, you have to look around and. And um, be in gratitude for everything and learn to breathe every day. Like you get in such a fight or flight response and very robotic in your emotions. Like, oh, get up, drink a shake, do this, do this, do this. It's like, how about you just like take a minute, maybe go outside no matter where you're at, mm -hmm. whether the sun is out or not, and just kind of be still for a minute. It's hard to do for an active mind. 
but how do you slow it down? Mm -hmm. The minute you can slow that process down where you don't hear anything, it's because you learn how to be still and you had to be in your body. But imagine if you're in your body, you're you're more conscious, you're more self-aware. Now you know who you are. Now you know like, yeah, I'm not feeling really good today, but now you know how to put words to it because you're being still. But when you're being in like this fight or flight response, like you're very reactionary, you don't know how to respond to other things that may occur. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to respond versus react. You know, I know like in America, like, and I'm sure they say it around the world, you know, when crisis happens, they say we send out our first responders. We don't send out our first reactors. Yeah. Respond. People that know how to respond to life are ones that are equipped with a certain level of confidence through their body of work, but they also have to be calm. They have to be calm. Like if someone is ill, um, uh, like an ER doctor is, has to be calm. They can't be like, uh, 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 you know, it doesn't work like that. They may give a direction to someone to get them what they need, but they have to be calm and being able to patch someone up or whatnot. So, you know, I have to, you know, increase the the vibrational energy and the frequency, and then also be mindful of every day. I have to thank my body for being here. Thank my body that I'm alive. Mm -hmm. Like, thank God that I still have this opportunity because I know a lot of people need to be wake, woken up and realize like, have you even thanked your body for what you put it through? All the workouts, all the pain, all the BS, like all the stuff, like you should thank yourself. And that was one of the things that my wife, you know, would say to me, she's like, Phil, like you went through all this pain throughout your entire life. And not once have you just sat there and be like, man, this is dope. Mm -hmm. Like I made it this far. I feel like your wife is such a huge part of the reason why you've overcome so much. Oh yeah. yeah. I give her a ton of credit, yeah. a ton of credit because before her, oh man, I mean, it was just difficult. And I was married once before and it was just not the same. Mm -hmm. Clearly. I mean, people could see, I mean, people have told me like, dude, like it's completely changed your life. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, absolutely. And I feel like this documentary with Breaking Olympia, a lot of women that support these strong males are going to be able to have their own community too. Because it is important that they um, are acknowledged, appreciated, and respected. But they need to know that they're not alone also. And um, they get to see my wife, you know, go through her battles with breast implant illness. She had four autoimmune issues, uh, disorders, and, you know, gained 60 pounds from, you know, black mold in her implants. And all while I'm, you know, trying to be the best in the world, and then I'm telling her, like, I shouldn't go to the gym. I should just hang out with you. And she's like, Phil, like you can't even fix this. Like you need to go do your job. I'll still make you meals. I'm like, you're, oh, man, I feel like such an ass. Like she's like, no, this is my, this is what I signed up for too. Talk about unconditional love there. You know, um, that's why we, we're, you know, we're husband and wife, but like real, when someone says this is my partner, Oh yeah, this is my ride or die, man. Like this is this is my mate. Right when you here. know that other person wants the absolute best for you and you can absolutely give yourself to them mm -hmm. and they will catch you. Yeah. That's where that positivity that you're talking about I feel is just born, uh, born from. Yeah. And um and going going back into the story, the the dark side that we're seeing in you from mm -hmm. a young age and you know not necessarily a bad side just a kid who grew up in difficult circumstances you know there were shootings and and it, it was scary times right and you, you you similarly to myself which i connected on again is the dark side in you you put down to your father yeah that aggressive you know competitiveness and i wondered now you know you obviously your dad passed away bless him and you are now an older man yourself. Do you look at him differently now that you're grown and you can reflect on things and you can almost get to know him in a, in a whole new way now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I remember, so my parents divorced for like when I was three mm -hmm. and you know, every kid wants his father around and he was quite distant. And, you know, you, you kind of have moments, even when my mother got remarried, Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a great guy. You know, he treated me great. You know, he wasn't abusive or anything. If anything, he was very supportive of my mother, who was a working woman. Mm -hmm. You know, she had her own career and uh, he provided. He was very basic. Like, I provide, you do this, you have your chores, this. It was very systematic. And uh, he was in the army and stuff like that, but he wasn't like a total drill sergeant. All he wanted me to do is just be uh, smart <laughs> and yeah. read and do those things. Um, but uh, yeah, my dad didn't go to any games. 
no basketball games, no track events. I can't remember any of them. I think the one time he did go was that I can remember he went to one track meet and then I think he went to my state championship game. I think he did. I can't, I don't actually, I don't, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, but you start to resent, you know, your father because you're like, man, like, why weren't you there? What the hell is going on? And then you kind of learn later on that, wow, like I, I share some similarities to this man. Maybe I should think about how his relationship with my mom was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me ask some questions from like an uncle or like a cousin and be like, Hey, what were they like? Yeah. And they're like, your mom's kind of stubborn, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, and I remember talking to one of my uncles, like my mom's brother. I'm like, he's like, yeah, your mom's something else sometimes so just understand like just understand that she could press buttons too so i'm like ah okay you know and it's not to point fingers or anything it just realized like they they had passion but just it couldn't go further it, it wasn't it just didn't work you know and uh hell i'm divorced too so like i get it and yes as you get older you start to connect but It'll be 10 years since my father passed later this month. Mm. Um, How are you and, feeling about that? You know, I had the date like marked down, right? Like, oh, I should probably just, because I buried him in Arlington, Texas. That's around the area where he's from. And I thought, oh, I should fly out there, which is like in another week, just to do like a 10-year thing. And I was like, I don't have to go do that. But if I just wake up, my wife knows, like I, I could just wake up on the, I think it was the 29th, so like the 27th, I'll just pick up and leave, you know, and just go do it and come right back. But I keep a bodybuilding show in Texas because of him. You know, I don't live in Texas, but I keep it there because I feel like I'm connected, but I've always been connected to him since he's passed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was given pretty much one month to live. He pretty much made it about a year tough and, dude. and just a tough dude, man. I oh, still remember, man, like I'll tell you a quick story. Like, <laughs> so, um, his his wife, my stepmom, was like, hey, this is what's going on with your father. You know, he should be okay, this and that. And so I don't know if she's lying. I don't know. But I'm just thinking, well, she would tell me. So I said, well, let me know if it gets bad. So like about six weeks out from the Olympia, it gets bad. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know? And there was no flights out. So I was like, I got to figure out a way. So I found a way to get out there. He's not eating not doing anything he's just kind of like accepting it right so the doctor you know anyone that has gone through this like the doctors try to oh yeah we're just trying to keep him comfortable blah, 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 blah. and i'm just like i'm not trying to hear this shit right now like you're talking about my damn dad dude like, i think he's just being stubborn i think he's just like not caring i don't think it's because of the disease that he has i think that he's still you know a superhero in my eyes you know, I didn't have to grow up with him to know that I share the same DNA. You're like, I'm like, fuck this, you know? So I'm like yelling at this doc and I like get up in his face where I'm like, oh man, security is probably going to throw me. I'm probably going to get arrested, you know? Uh -huh. And I, and I looked him in the eye and I said, he's a Heath. It's my father you're talking about. That's my last name. He's going to be all right. I'm going to go into this room and he and I are going to talk about this. So I go into the room and I was like, look, pop, like, I love you. And we have just now started to really connect. And I get it. You're here, but you need to eat, man. What the hell's going on? He didn't really say much. You know, he was just like, oh, Phil, you know, they're just trying to talk about deflection. I was like, no, you need to eat, Pop. Like, what's going on? So I said, I'm going to come back here. And, um, it's, you know, I have to go compete. And that's when he said, and my my half brother, so same dad, different mom, um, Brandon, who's a freaking giant. He's like six nine, three hundred pounds. Like, Whoa. yeah. <laughs> so I could tell you guys, mom's okay. genetics on that. So they left the room, and it's just my dad and I. And he looks at me and he goes, "Remember that belt I whipped your ass with?" And I was like, "Dad, you like used it once, you know?" And yeah. he's like, "Yeah, I know, but you're gonna take that same belt and whip their ass too." He's like, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I said, oh, yeah. So I left and I was like, oh, these guys are so screwed now. It's like he gave me some energy and I felt like I gave him some energy back. But long of the short of it is um, I remember my mother was contacted by his wife, my stepmom. Mm -hmm. 
And so my mom calls me up and I was like, what's going on? And she's like, your father's eating. I was like, how would you know? You know, cause you, you don't have like direct contact with my, with your ex-husband. She was like, no, they, they told me. And I said, he's been eating since when? She said, since you left. So I was like, hell yeah. And it taught me that like, that's so powerful. You know, he, he just, it's like, he needed to know that his son loved him. He needed to know that I cared that I didn't hold resentment. I didn't have that. So of course, you know, I, you know, I, I won that show. And then that following year. Before you move on from that. Yeah. How did that feel to win the show? After your dad said that, man. Well, yeah, we, yeah, I appreciate you mentioning and cutting me off because I missed a point. Yeah, yeah. There's a moment in breaking Olympia where there's a video where my dad speaks mm. and now he was in that same hospital bed. Mm -hmm. And basically, without giving it away, is that he just shared his excitement for me winning. And um, after after he wasn't there at your earlier competitions when you were a basketball player, right? That must have felt like yeah, it felt amazing because you know when I became Mister Olympia, I had flown him out for the shows, so he had seen me be on stage, and he had seen me win a title. Um but to know that he gave me that added boost while well, me giving him a boost, it like brought us even closer. So obviously that following year he passed, but before that, you know, I just remember being so excited and watching him decline was very, very tough, mm -hmm. but it was something that I just wanted him to know that we are good. Cause he would kind of be like, like, almost like in regret, like, man, I wish we would have done this. I'm like, yeah. dad, I really don't care. Like, how about we just sit down and like, try to talk about something else. And some, and a lot of it was just he and I just share in silence. Cause I think he was just in his head a lot, like replaying things. Mm -hmm. And I only know that because I'm from him. Yeah. <laughs> so I, it's funny. Like when you look at your pops and you, you look at him, you're like, that's this, as you get older, you know, you're like, wait a minute. I look, I look like that. Yeah. I can see that. That movement, mm -hmm. that tick, that stare, that glare, that, huh. Okay, so once I see it, then I accept it. Now I connect with it. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he um, he was stubborn. He wanted to make sure that uh, when he was getting ready to pass, that no one was there. And I remember seeing every time I would fly back and forth from Denver, Colorado to Seattle to go visit him, I would always tell him, obviously, I love him. And I'll see you next time. I'll see you next week or next two weeks. And I remember this last time I was, I was getting ready to fly to Cleveland, Ohio to go guest post. And I was like, Hey pops, like I, I, I got to go work, but after I'm done, I got to go to Germany for FIBO. I'm going to come right back. So I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay, Phil. Okay. And as I walk out, I was like, I don't know about this one. Hmm. And I looked back and I was like, nah, just get out of your head. Just go, you know, just leave. And, um, you felt uh, lo and behold, like, yeah, you know, a week later, even less than a week later, he was gone after I, um, I was on stage at a show and, you know, it, it sucked. It hurt, you know, it hurts for, but it hurts for everyone in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some people get to stay by this, the bedside. I was on bodybuilding stage. Mm -hmm. when that happened and I had to go do a meet and greet right after. And I'm glad I did it because he wanted me to do that. You did the meet and greet. Yeah. In, in, with the knowledge as well. Yeah. I found out right after I got off stage you and, dedicated I had, and, I, and I still had it. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. But he told me, I, f I felt him. It was like, I'm good. Go to work. And even as I say it now, I'm like, that's exactly how I, how I would be if I, I don't have children, but like I would tell my son, I'd be like, I'm, I'm gone, mm -hmm. but I'm with you. So when I hear those whispers from my father, mm -hmm. I don't say it's weird. I don't say it's strange. I just say, thank you. And I use it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for anyone out there that like is feeling those vibes from someone that's passed on, Oh man, there's so much more with you than they, I, I smile even, I smile more now talking about my father mm -hmm. because of what he did stand for, the things that he did do, the memories that we did have wasn't a ton, but man, like what quality moments, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like quality moments. And, um, 
yeah, dude, it's, um, I know I'm going to probably be a wreck next week. <laughs> yeah. But I, I will say every time I watch Breaking Olympia, I, I get emotional every time around Thought that. a couple segments. Yeah, for sure. And it was, it was tough, you know, like when we had our premiere a few days ago. So I was kind of looking around and I remember just grabbing, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, relax, Phil. Like you're grabbing the armrest like pretty hard. Mm-hmm. And then Sheree touched my hand. And I've, and then when she got emotional, I was like, oh man. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's just, but how beautiful is it that, you know, you can, as a man, like you can be in a space where you feel comfortable to be emotional in that aspect, to not always have this hardened heart. It doesn't mean that you're a wimp or anything like that. It just means that you know how to feel things. And I think life is about feeling things. It's about seeing things. It's about doing things. It's about feeling things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You you really explained that so well. And I think what's great is a bloke like yourself who's a hulking physique throughout that, just being vulnerable, letting it, letting out the the demons and, and any anything that you potentially have held back previously to that. And, and you clearly really grasp what it is to be a man. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like no, in, being a man is something that it's, we're all on that fucking journey as, as, yeah. as young blokes. And you think holding it in is the answer. And obviously it, it, it isn't. And it is nice that you can still connect with them and, and looking at, you know, your, what led you to success, in my opinion, is extreme dedication to a very uh, regimented uh, routine. Mm-hmm. And look, the fact that he was an army drill sergeant, it makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. Like That's in your blood to, to, to be that kind of character. Um, so bodybuilding is a lot of things, right? You know, from the posing, the lifting, to the, you know, eating and everything else that you put yourself through. But what, do, what is it to you? What do you think it is to you, essentially, if you were to boil it down? I just look at it as the emotional connection, the connection with the mind and the body. I have something in my mind that I want to do, like I want to train, but then you have these eyes (laughs) and you have to look in the mirror and then see like, okay, what do I want to improve on? This is my body. These are the machines that can help me sculpt these things. Okay, now that I've seen it, What's my ability to even do the exercise itself and how does it feel? You've got to be very truthful with yourself. Oh, man, you can't be in delusion, that's for sure. Mm. <laughs> like a lot of people, you know. Yeah. And um, I've been very fortunate to train by myself predominantly throughout my entire career where, you know, I've always been my hardest critic and I don't have like that entourage of like, yeah, I feel you look fucking great. <laughs> you, know, you know, you see, I mean, look, like I, I've, I beat a lot of guys that had a large entourage telling them how great they are. And I think sometimes training partners are, are awesome. Could I have lifted heavier with a training partner? Absolutely. But did I need someone to just, you know, be in my ear nonstop? No, because I knew what I wanted. I wanted to be a champion. Um, so yeah, I feel like bodybuilding is that extreme connection with self. Mm. You have to know who you are through pain. You have to know, uh, how disciplined you are through repetition, through consistency. How do you be consistent with your schedule, with your eating schedule? I mean, that was something I had to learn. You know, first first off, like, how do you eat every three hours, man? Mate, you must be great at doing things you don't yeah. really want to do. Yeah, like, <laughs> I didn't like it. Yeah, you couldn't have. Like, I haven't eaten today. I've no. just had this coffee. And, you know, back then I had, you know, it was a requirement. You know, being a basketball player, you don't really have to eat. Mm. You know, you can have Skittles and candy and get just play. Yeah. But um, other sports don't understand. I think, I yeah. don't think bodybuilding, of, of all the people I've interviewed, mate, yep. I don't know if there's another sport that requires 24 7 dedication down to how much you sleep, down to everything. Yes. It's insane. They're like behind, in my opinion. And it's not to minimize what they do, it's yeah. just that it's just not a prerequisite for success. You could be naturally gifted in with your hands, you mm-hmm. know, with your feet, you know, um, but you don't have to diet like <laughs> like how we do. And everything is so um, highly intentional on your physical performance. But, yeah, the bodybuilding means, you know, a soulful connection with your body the, where you can actually go through life and still be consistent. You you have the ability to be accountable. A lot of people don't want to be accountable for their actions, but as a bodybuilder, you have to. No one can lift those weights for you. 
You have to give a damn about your success more than anyone else in the room. So I can't want you to win more than you want to win. Which is kind of unhealthy a little bit in terms of like the narcissistic side of our personalities yeah. actually are a massive advantage oh, in that. Yeah. So the, so you and your prime must have been a version of you that maybe uh, you yeah. don't look back on fondly as a, as a human as much as what you are now, maybe. You might think you're a better human now, I assume. Much better. Yeah. I love you, man. Like, this, is, this is because I'm like, yeah. I mean, obviously you get it. Mm. Massive narcissist. Yeah. Well, my dad was a bodybuilder. Like, He's you, the biggest just, narcissist I know. No, you, <laughs> dude, like you are, like you're thinking, well, that shit don't matter. Like what this, this matters. Yep. Everything from second. No, I don't really. No, I don't really care. Yeah, and it's almost like I have to tell you something that I have to treat someone with like almost this callous view mm. because this is about me. Like, sorry but not sorry was like a big quote. You know, like over. <laughs> sorry not sorry. I can't go to your baseball game. Like, sorry not sorry. I can't hang out with you. Mm. Hey, sorry not sorry, man. You're talking about shit on the phone. That just I, I don't really give a fuck. No. I, I gotta go eat and I gotta go train today. You know, and, and some of that stuff is important too. You got to protect your energy, but at the same time, I mean, man, like I do think about, you know, maybe saying no maybe, is huge, is not it? Yeah. Like, man. And then when you realize how you've treated <laughs> certain situations, you then try to make up for it by being overly like happy go lucky. And then so like these ebbs and flows. So you're very unstable. You mean like compensating, trying to be overly nice? Yeah, overly nice. And then you end up messing something up, you know, by doing that. Because you're not balancing. You're thinking you're balancing things. Really, you're just effing up twice by doing that. Like I made some really bad decisions, like as far as business is concerned, by overly being nice to someone that was a complete dick. Yeah, been there. You know, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, you know, I kind of treated this guy like shit. So, oh, yeah, be my friend. Yeah. And really, I should have been looking at this guy like yeah this is a guy that's trying to steal from me and he mm. does Fuck me. So, you know what i mean Being there, yeah. yeah so you know it, bodybuilding means a lot of different things but one thing that you cannot do you cannot be a rock star and a bodybuilder you have to be fully committed like wholeheartedly my first competition uh, as an amateur i do this show i win the show and um so you got to see those photos bro you are so gifted and i know you called yeah. the gift but like when I seen you, I was like, I, I've seen all these young bodybuilders. I remember looking at Dorian Yates when he started. I've, I've looked to see, like, how genetically gifted are they? Because I was looking at myself when I was a young yeah, guy. I, yeah. I, I realized pretty quickly, I was like, oh, no, this is different. You were a freak. Yeah, thanks, you? dude. Yeah. Like, it's insane what, what you, you looked like the, as a kid. Yeah, you got to see the very first selfie oh, of yeah. Phil Heath that has never that been. That blew my mind, that first did picture. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, how much had you been training then? Like, Dude, that was... That was the first day. Wow. And it's so cool. I'll, I'll give myself some credit. I remember taking, well, I've said this on interviews before. I, I started bodybuilding October 8th, 2002, blah, 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 blah. I took a picture. Da, da, da. I show you the freaking photo. Man. And when. Old men people, don't create equal man. It's right, not fair. When people, when we watched the, when we were at the premiere, it was like a gasp. And like people were like in the theater, like, whoa, because that was the shot. I remember being in the house. I told, I was like, man, when are the guys going to leave? Cause I was, even though I wasn't playing anymore, I was still living at the basketball house. So they were going, going off to practice. I was like, okay, I finally got this digital camera. I'm going to set it up right here, set the timer. I'm just going to, what do I do? What do I do? I was like, shit, just take your shirt off. And I had my track pants still on. And I was like, uh, okay, boom. And I only took one picture. It was like, boom. Wow. And I was like, this is, this is your start. And I didn't, and you know, it's funny. I didn't look at it like, wow, you look great because <laughs> I was obviously comparing myself to people that were already competing. that were already training for this. I was just a division one basketball player, uh, shortly removed from playing hoops. I played my last game. Oh well, yeah. That would have been six months. No, seven months prior to that photo being taken. So I hadn't really begun the bodybuilding journey. I was just doing basketball workers. In fact, I was still playing, you know, open gym and stuff like that. But that was the day I said, no more basketball at all. I'm only going to, I'm only going to do this bodybuilding stuff. And, um, I took pictures every week, but then after I competed in that first contest and won, I did something I shouldn't, well, I'm glad I did it because I, I learned a lesson 
I went out partying that night, mm-hmm. drinking keg stands. <laughs> I did a keg stand in my post. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the next day, the um, my teammates had told, you know, the coaching staff, hey, Phil did this bodybuilding show, man. He won. He freaking won the whole fucking thing mm-hmm. so some of the assistant coaches came by and they're like hey Heath like what's going on I was like oh nothing they're like yeah congratulations hey man let, let me see and I was like uh uh-uh. uh they're like come on man why not and I was like nah man I, I don't feel so well and they're like oh okay no problem the reason is because me not knowing that you can't be a rock star and a bodybuilder I had gained all that weight of water oh yeah yeah and I was bloated in the face and like Pudgy, I had like one ab, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I had like a pony keg, you know, I didn't know how to, you know, get rid of that fluid. And I learned, I was like, oh, so as a bodybuilder, even after the show is over, it's not like other sports where you can go drink beer and eat, eat food and cause you're starving. Right. But you have to really have another method after the show. So such delayed gratification, like you have instant gratification, but then you have to still say, okay, I want to maintain something unachievable and then slowly get back to normal life. And, um, that was really, uh, that was really tough for me, um, because I just wanted to eat, dude. I just wanted to be normal again. And I, I hadn't fully accepted it until I'd say, um, after I did my first Arnold Classic in 2007, where I went out again as a pro, I was like, I got fit that my first Arnold Classic. I want to. I want to eat pasta. I want to do this. And next thing you know, I gained like thirty pounds just like in one day. And you know that means bad things are coming. And uh, it took me like a week and a half to get that water off by doing cardio because you can't just do the cardio and get it off, right? Like you may have to run diuretics just to get that down. Now you're playing with some things that you shouldn't be messing. Diuretics with. dangerous. Absolutely. Well, just a little story. My obviously, I said my dad was a bodybuilder. He was rolling around with like Mr. Universe type guys. Oh man. Junior Mr. Universe was uh, his best friend. He died Mm. uh, using diuretics. Yeah. Because he drained himself to such a level. Um, And so it is scary. It's scary stuff. So, you know, I, I learned very early on, like when you decide to be a bodybuilder, there's a lot of gray area and you can't dabble in that. You got to be very conscious and, It really requires an ultimate level of discipline, ultimate, like nothing to minimize any other sport. But after a fighter is done, they can, I've seen them. I've been to UFC fights. I've been to boxing matches. Like they can eat, they can still hang out. They can have cake. The bodybuilders can too, but at some degree, they're going to have to really ignite. And everybody's different. That's what's crazy. A bikini chick is different from a, you know, women's physique competitor or figure competitor or a men's physique is different from an open class guy. Some men's physique guy can kill over and die because he probably ran too many Mm -hmm. diuretics, right? So everybody has to be mindful of what they put in their body, how they adjust uh, Mm -hmm, mm post-show. But um, yeah, the bodybuilding stuff, man, it's, it's, and it's always evolving. So you always have to be a student of your, of yourself and with new technology and with PEDs and all that stuff, like you have to be very, very careful because people have died. Yeah. I mean, straight up, like we already know, we all know someone, whether they were a pro or just a guy at the gym. Yeah. You know, that just took it too far and just didn't take their health seriously. Didn't get their blood work done. There was insulin, obviously that caused a lot of deaths as well, um, which is extremely dangerous. I know you've come out and said that you wouldn't have, have never, used that. yeah, but I thought about it at one point, no lie, of course, but then I had to, it was one of those things where I'm like, why mm-hmm. you're already at that time. I was five time Mr. Olympia. So I was like, man, maybe I just try it. And then my trainer was like, you can grab it, but like, I advise against it. He's like, I know guys that did that and it worked but maybe it only worked like one time. So then I started really researching and I was like, when I say research, I'm thinking of like all the guys that I beat that I know that do it. And just to summarize, I mean, a lot of guys online will say like, of course, Phil, he does it because everybody else does. It's like, that's not the case because there's other things I didn't do either. You know, that Mm -hmm. people probably thought I did, but I think once they see like in breaking Olympia, like the 
initial photos, they'll be like, oh, well, he probably didn't. It's assumed, right? Like yeah. you did everything possible. Right. I mean, yeah. I did everything possible on the recovery side as well. Like <clears> I, <throat> I, you know, I did things that they didn't even know I was doing, like hyperbaric therapy, infrared mm. saunas, like doing chiropractic three days a week, like all these different things. Um, grounding mats and, you know, the detoxes. I even did fucking colonics, dude. Whoa. I didn't want to do that. That was something <laughs> that the wifey was like, you need to go to get that done. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I really don't want to do this. Wow. And she's like, I want you to be around. I want you to be around forever. I was like, that's a good, that's a good argument, babe. Like, yeah. Okay. But you know, you know, with the PADs, I felt like with the YouTube thing, as you've mentioned, that there was like a wave of people, experts, coming mm. out and giving all of these huge cycles. Yeah. And, and I wondered what it was like for you watching that happen, because you're obviously in the know. Right. And you're watching all of these basically morons telling people to just take as much as humanly possible. Do you think that's like one of the main basic mistakes that young bodybuilders make is they just think more juice equals Mr. Olympia? Correct. Yeah. I think majority of the people that are out there on vlogs should be damn near banned. Damn near, because I believe in free speech, but I say damn near because... It's dangerous at It's time. so dangerous, like, and the, to sensationalize it. I mean, we, we got people under the age of 25 that are clearly doing these things and making money from it on YouTube. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These are teenagers. Teenagers probably. shouldn't even be touching steroids, right? Like, and, and this is like... I had a conversation the other day. I was at an event and uh, some of these kids were like, yeah, yeah, th there's no problem with it. Like you did it. And I go, yeah, but huh? You're like, how old are you? Well, I'm 19. He's 17. He's 20. And I go, why would you do that? Well, this guy's doing it. This guy, And I was go, you realize that that sounds like drugs, right? Like just like, well, he's smoking pot. Mm -hmm. He's doing Coke. Like what's the problem? The problem is, is that with bodybuilders, especially the youth, even if you're 25 and you just started training, you didn't even give yourself an opportunity to learn how to train. You said this at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You didn't even give yourself an opportunity to even know if you even like bodybuilding. You immediately said, I'm going to do these steroids and it's just going to work out. <laughs> you don't know how to train. You don't know how to diet. You really don't know how to competition prep. You're getting advice for some dude at a gym. You're probably not getting prescribed medications also. And you've got good natural testosterone at that age anyway. And they have no, I challenge, and I, and I say this at events to young kids. Yeah. I say, you don't, you haven't even gotten your blood work done, huh? And they go, and I go, you know how ignorant you are? Mm -hmm. You know how stupid, this is stupid. I don't want to call you stupid. <laughs> this is stupid. This is reckless. Yeah. I get my blood work all the time every three, four months mm -hmm. because I need to know that data. And if you're 20 years old, you're going to sit here and tell me I'm a 44 year old man. You're going to tell me that your testosterone is low. It's a, come on. Like, and how, <laughs> you don't even know your blood work. You need, and you also need to know not just your testosterone, but you need to know your testosterone free. You need to know the total. You need to know your hematocrit, your hemoglobin. You need to know what your A1C, you need to know your creatinine levels. You need to know all these things, you know, your AST, ALT, you know, you need to know all these things because you could be doing something that is highly detrimental to your body, to your organs. And then you'll be the guy that ruins it for all of us because you decided to, you know, take all these jabs and of gear and stuff, and then you become an idiot and then kill over and die. Like you, you shouldn't be doing this. And a lot of time I feel like we're in the age where majority of the people who we follow online regarding gear don't even compete. I feel like Rich Piano was the, the, the biggest name in, in the world for that. Good. He, he was a nice guy to me, but at mm -hmm. the same time, I feel like. I say was because for those who don't know. He, he also, passed, yeah, yeah, he also dabbled in party drugs too. Yep. So I don't think people realize like it can open up a whole other world too, a whole other portal of things. And I can only imagine what it is to be an influencer that doesn't compete, has no interest because they know deep down, like, why should I compete? Like I can just go do some gear and actually look swole and then filter my images or have it filmed a certain way and um, gain a bunch of followers. And next thing I know, I get a bunch of sponsors and, yeah, man, I'm just like Phil Heath, man. Like I got more followers than him and I can do this. You know what I'm saying? So like yeah. we live in this society where an algorithm can make you famous for what? 
What do you make of that new young lad? I forgot his name. You know, um, you might have seen him. He's got the long, curly hair. And he, oh, Sam. Yeah. What do you make of that situation? Because he's a very young man and he, very. he's running a lot of juice, clearly. I mean, I have no idea what the cycle is, right? But I can say this. I mean, I met him. He was a nice guy. Mm -hmm. I feel like he has um, an interest to compete. He went to Dino's gym, which was interesting because he was um, put through the pace as far as posing is, is concerned. He got a fucking wake-up call. And I'm glad he did because he. I feel like he is now at a point where if he really wants to compete, He's got to make that look effortless now. So it can't just be like, okay, I film content and this and that. And then for those who don't yeah. know, sorry, po posing is very difficult because you're holding these poses for long periods of time. Yeah. That's why when you're on stage, you're blowing out your ass and yeah. it's hard. It's My dad difficult. actually was really good at that. He taught me a lot about that. Yeah. So it's not easy because you're flexing things that it's not just your biceps. It's mm -hmm. everything. And people are looking at everything. Every deal. And yeah, a picture, you know, is only a fragment of a second, right? Whereas the video, you're like, man, this guy held that pose for 10 seconds and then did the other one for 12 and then the other one for 10. Stamina required, really, isn't it? 100%. For a, for a big dude to have that level of stamina, is, it's really it's conflicting, not, right? Because you're right. supposed to have a lot of stamina. You're explosive. Right. So my thing with Sam is I don't, I haven't sat down with him <clears throat> to figure out exactly what the, the game plan is. I don't know his coach that well. I don't. I just don't know the strategy. But what I will say is, it's it's very interesting to see someone as um, sensational as this guy is, and have the following he has. But I don't know if there's educational content as to how he got there. So I feel like there's an element missed because if there is drugs involved and you're not explaining it to the next person that adores you. I get there's a double-edged sword with this. Like if you say, oh yeah, I'm on test and I'm on this, I'm on that. Well, we all know you're committing a felony <laughs> yeah, because it's illegal. And that's the other part. The minute you admit it, well, pe people can say, well, you're a cheat, but then everybody knows you're doing it, but then you're being disingenuous. It's a fucking it hard situation. So it's hard, right? Mm. You know, it's not calling him a bad person. It's just like, but let's be, let's be clear. Like, the person that follows not just him, but people that look like him that are under the age of 30 or even 25. I can't remember. I, how old is he? 20. He's a young guy, 20 or 20, early 20. So it'd be interesting. Like if I had him on here, I'd be like, so when did you start? Mm. Cause I'm curious too, because how does, how does that resonate with a 14 year old, a 15 year old? They may look at him and say, well, I don't care about competing because, Oh, that takes a lot of work. Yeah. It takes a lot of years. So we all have our own lane in this space and I feel like we can all, you know, make a living from it and whatnot, but I think it's how you do it. What you know? do you, what, you know, in terms of the guys who you worked out with, was there ever any cycles that you got wind of where you were like, Phew. oh yeah, like, I've, I've heard some like, and, and from like extremely reliable. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like what was the craziest one that you were like, wow, I can't believe that guy. Oh yeah. I, I can't say who, but like five grams of test. And then like off season per what per week? Yeah, like I've heard, yeah I've known some guys that do three mm -hmm. plus like all these you know it's funny like all these other type of compounds that I wouldn't even know like I'm like what's Incrilex like I don't know what the fuck that is like all these different types of insulins all these different types of tests mm -hmm. then you got Deca you have EQ then you have Trend then you and I'm like dude like Trend all right all right you guys are like how do how do you not cough your lungs out mm -hmm. like that shit i'd taken that and got the trend cough and you're like i'm dying you know like you're like i've I don't, seen people talk like, about i don't like not want i don't not want that in my body anymore mm -hmm. like that shit is crazy um but yeah i've i've heard like t over 10 grams of oils in a week i've heard these stories and i'm and what's crazy to me is do what you want but did you win <laughs> This is my, yeah. this is my issue with it. Like, okay, it's your body. It's your life, right? But you took these compounds to win. And then when you didn't, did you become delusional and say, well, Ronnie Coleman's doing this. It just must, it must be something else that they're doing more or, mm -hmm. or feel he didn't dude. Like I didn't weigh 300 pounds. That's what I loved about seeing your first picture because it blows away just like many of the other first pictures of Mr. Olympias, mm -hmm. this idea that you were a skinny kid who had no muscle 
who turned into Mr. Olympia. No, you had the genetics, you did the training. And then of course you add in what you need to later. But like, it, it's, it's an illusion that people have the, this delusion of, if I just yeah. take all of this shit, I'm going to be this guy. And that's just not how it works. right? Well, now we're seeing, if you notice, we're seeing a lot of guys, um, because the barrier of entry in the world of fitness online is very low, very low. You, the barrier of entry to be uh, a track star is pretty high because mm -hmm. you got to be fast. You got to be able to jump uh, a person. The barrier of entry of being a basketball player is pretty high because you can't just go into a basketball gym and say, Hey, I got next and then get picked up. And now you're like a pro mm -hmm. bodybuilding is probably the, the only sport where because of PDs, there are people that don't have the genetics, but can take things and abuse them and actually look pretty damn good online. On the synthol and stuff like right. that, which so, people can and you, inflate their muscles with. Right. And if it's not on video, mm -hmm. um, they can kind of position themselves a certain way without even Photoshopping, right? And then you have that part. Mm -hmm. You can't Photoshop a slam dunk. You know what I mean? Like you can't Photoshop like a guy jumping from the free throw line. Like, I guess you could, but like <laughs> you could figure that out pretty quick, yeah. but you could Photoshop or, or do this or do that. But like, you can't, you can't take a, you know, a bottle of test and go dunk a basketball next week. It, it takes a lot of work to even, you know, touch the net and then touch the backboard and touch the rim. And well, you were, you were dunking a 5'9", mate. I was, I was impressed with that. Well, I'm glad they were able Legend. to show in uh, Breaking Olympia me dunking that basketball. Yeah. I was 235 pounds in that photo. Bro. That was after I did the Junior Nationals. So I did the Junior Nationals in mm -hmm. 2005, right? I won the overall. I get a call from the late Peter McGuff. He says, hey, we're going to fly you from Chicago to LA. We want to bring you in for a photo shoot with Joe Weider, all that stuff. They said, bring basketball shorts and some shoes. It's like, okay. I always have basketball shorts and some shoes. So I do that. I go to the Chatsworth Powerhouse Gym near the Woodland Hills, former Weider headquarters, right? I meet with Robert Reef and Peter McGuff. They're like, hey, we're going to take some photos um, showcasing like, you being a former basketball player and so we're on a basketball court. So they deflated the basketball. They say, Phil, we want you to like yeah. crush the basketball. And then you're going to hit some poses with the basketball in one hand and have a dumbbell in the other hand. We're doing all these cool poses. And then they say, okay, um, can you give him a basketball, please? Yep. Okay, Phil. Now go dunk it. He said, excuse me. They're like, yeah, you know, like you <laughs> could dunk your basketball, go dunk it. And I was like, I can shoot it. You know, they're like, <laughs> No, 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 you could try it. I said, give me five minutes. Give me five minutes. So now I'm like stretching. I'm like, shit. And in my head, I'm like, okay, you haven't dunked a basketball in a while, you know, like, but then again, I mean, it's been, you know, two and a half, three years since you really, really done that. Let's, let's just seize this moment right now. Like, mm -hmm. what if it does work? If it don't work, it don't work, you know, but like, if it does, it's going to be killer. So I, so I told Peter McGuff, I said, I want you, I'm going to pass the ball to you and I want you to bounce it right here. I'm going to grab it, cut, and I'm going to dunk this thing. He said, okay. So I, so it's just like if I was doing a layup line mm -hmm. and he does it and I just go, I, I dunk it first try, dunk it. Robert Reef says, okay, now do it again. <laughs> <laughs> You've just given me everything in this one shot, and now you're saying do it again. Now do it again. Now twist your body. Now put oh, t God. take your tongue out like Jordan. Do this. Do that. But don't, because uh, I'm thinking I just want to dunk the ball. Like like here's the basket. I want to dunk it right here or right here. He wanted me to come from the other side, which is kind of hard, you know, um, because I'm I'm not a one foot jumper. I'm mm -hmm. a two foot jumper, and being 180 pounds. Dunking a basketball, it's much different with 235. It's 50, 50 more Bro, it's pounds. insane, man. It's not even human. And I'm, <laughs> and I just got done competing. So I'm already depleted. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm depleted, but then I've rebounded because I competed at 210. Mm. So <laughs> now I done gained 25 pounds, but I did it, man. And, and I'm so glad that we captured that because that, that same photograph was in my first cover of Flex magazine as a fold out poster. Yeah. So sick. it was killer, man. So I'm, I'm shout out to Robert Reef, man. Like, you know, in, in the late Peter McGuff, because they pushed my ass to do that. And I'm glad I was able to, because 
technically no other bodybuilder in the history of our sport has ever had that moment. <laughs> no way. No, like, you can't find it anywhere. Like I did it and I got that, uh, that cover shot the night I turned pro and wow. went into Mr. USA that following month. All right. Unfortunately, we, we can't uh, go too much longer because Phil has a, a busy schedule today. So I've got a, a couple of little questions left. Um, what would your friends say is your best quality? I'm too nice. Oh, really? My, my best friends know I'm too nice. Yeah. Um, but you're very generous. Yeah. 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 Fair. That's yeah. a nice one. Um, yeah. What about your work? What do you think is your worst quality? Then I'm too nice. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm too trustworthy. I like like I, I trust too quick. Yeah. Um, cause I, I want everybody to win. And, um, it's like, I, I didn't grow up with any brothers or sisters. So I want, Same. like, I just want that. Oh, I just want everybody to be Here's happy. Everyone. Yeah. People pleasing. Yeah. My final question is always the same. I like to ask this to everyone. How would you like to be remembered? As a man who truly lived up to his potential and decided that ain't good enough because he always wanted more, but he also wanted more from everyone else around him. Yeah, I felt that. Yeah. I felt that from from everything I watched, mate. I really wish we could do longer. Phil has a, he's only in the UK for a short time, but I'm really grateful for this time, mate. It's no, meant thank a lot you, bro. Um, that, that's Phil Heath. The documentary is out soon. Uh, Breaking Olympia. What what a documentary! I'll, I'll put the links to everything in the description below. Uh, we'll see you on the next one. Cheers. <laughs>